Hey guys, welcome to Electronic Dance Money, your number one business resource for making money as electronic musicians and producers. Okay, awesome. So we're back with another new episode of Electronic Dance Money. What's up, everyone tuning in? Today, I've got a great guest, someone that I admire and have followed for a couple of years now, so I'm super excited to have him here. We've got Bjorgvin Benedictson. I said that correctly, right? Sweet. Yes, of course. You're the author. So you've got two books. We're going to be talking about one of them. The first book is Step by Step Mixing, which you got some pretty good notoriety out of that one, didn't you? Yeah, I it's it's sells keep selling. So uh, people keep buying it. People keep reviewing it. It has, I think, 395 reviews on Amazon Damn. now. Uh, it yeah, sells it, about 20 copies a day. So I think I'm about 15 to 20,000 copies sold, which is dude. good for a niche industry like audio. <laughs> yeah, congrats. That's awesome. I mean, talk about which I'm going to be mentioning it. Passive income. That's I mean, great way to just get that, you know, get that source of income kind of flowing in every single day. That's congrats, dude. But then you also have you're also very well known for your website audio issues, which you have. I think you were I, I remember I made a post, I think, in the six figure home studio community about how people get leads. And I think you mentioned you have what, over like a thousand blog rights or something on your website? Yeah, so I've Audio Issues is 10 years old. So I've been blogging about audio production, music mixing and, and random stuff. I'll also just like a bunch of weird stories from my life. <laughs> For about 10 years, I started off in 2009 as a school project at the SA Institute in Madrid, where I went to audio engineering school. And I started the blog as a way to just start uh, writing down what I was learning to pay it forward and sort of kind of solidifying the knowledge in my head, because if you can teach something, uh, you, you know it better than if you're just trying to learn it yourself, because it just, there's, there's some sort of mind shift that happens when you need to be able to teach something. So I wrote everything down I was learning, and I just never stopped writing. And I think, uh, like you said, it has probably about 1,000 blog posts on that site, and then uh, there's content all over uh, various other <laughs> audio production websites online. And yeah, so it's been going for a while. Dude, that's fantastic. You, that, you're 100% right about the teaching thing. For some reason, even like, which we'll probably talk about imposter syndrome a little bit, but I mean, I always experience imposter syndrome, especially with the podcast, funny enough. And I think it's something about that vul even more vulnerability of like, putting yourself out there. Um, but I'll, I'll have topic ideas and I'm like, am I, do I even know what I'm talking about here? Like, is this going to be good? And I always freak out about that. And then I start talking about it. And then I kind of forget what I've talked about in the episode until I start editing it. And I really listen to it. I'm like, oh, wow, this is like a crazy wealth of knowledge. Okay. I do know at least a little bit. So that's, you know, that's, that's nice. But even when I do lessons or even blog rights as well, it's like, oh, Okay, I actually think I know what I'm talking about. Fine, I find oh, all of a sudden I know what a compressor is because I'm explaining it to someone. It's that sort of stuff that just kind of solidifies what you know and um, what you might need to work on and learn a little bit more about. How can I figure this out in order to t teach other people? Really, that's that's the thing. Right. So, um, why don't you first kind of introduce yourself and your kind of history in music and where you've how you've gotten to where you're at because i would argue you're pretty pretty damn successful in the audio industry so why don't you just tell your story sure thank you Owen. thank you for saying that i appreciate that a lot um okay so let's let's rewind a little bit uh so first of all i've been a musician since i was 50 i've been in band since i was 15 i've played an instrument in some way shape or form since i was eight i uh, started off in audio because I was a youth leader at a, in Iceland, all of these sort of uh, junior high schools from like 13 to 16 year olds. And then you have uh, sort of college level youth centers as well. And so I was a youth leader at a youth center for ages 13 to 16. 
And basically, I was in a band. I was in a rock band at the time, so I was like the cool rock lead guitar player in that youth center. And I had like a music club where basically my job was to help teenagers like form a band and be in a band and play together and jam, which is not a bad gig and a bad job to have when you're uh, not at all 20. I was 20 at the time. And so from there, I, I was doing music and I was playing live and I was working at, in, in education basically. And one day I got a sort of a, the youth leader, youth centers got a memo. It was like, we're doing a workshop on live sound in this, uh, at this other music venue slash center for, for teenagers. Anybody who wants to come, uh, check it out and learn how to like connect gear and stuff. And, and I had been, I was in a band. We were recording, we had recorded our own album at the time. We like created our own recording studio in our rehearsal space and recorded a debut album, which does not sound great. But uh, still proud of it anyway. <laughs> but at that time, I was just the lead guitar player. I was just like the asshole uh, guitar player that wanted to be louder in the mix or thought right. all, thought everything sounded like shit. And but when we got that sort of email to, uh, to for that workshop, I went down there. I was encouraged to go check it out. So I went down there, and basically it was just like a crash course in Signal Flow, how to connect a uh, an analog sixteen channel mixer to a PA. And how microphones worked and all that sort of things that I kind of knew a little bit about. But then I got sort of a crash course in running live sound. And little did I know at the time that basically the guy that was running the workshop, he was like the live sound dude for the town or the town council. And he didn't want to run sound for that venue uh, any longer or, or didn't always have time to do it or whatever. So because I was fairly enthusiastic about it. I had played that music venue before um, and it was a really cool sort of underground up and coming bands. Uh, and I, yeah, a lot, a lot of cool Icelandic bands came out of that music venue or came through that venue. And I kind of jumped at the opportunity. I was like, well, let's try this out. Uh, I'll, I'll see. Um, I'll try being like, I'll try doing live sound. And you know, Getting an hour or two hour crash course in uh, signal flow and, and connecting cables does not make you a live sound engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would either. <laughs> so it was a lot of trial by fire, but basically it was like, well, if you want this, uh, if you want this job, like you're hired, uh, we already have your uh, information from the other center because everything, everything's very, when you're in a democratic socialist country uh, and you work for the town, everything's very well connected. So it's just like, we'll just put you on the payroll here you work here too now and the there's a gig on thursday you should come and you'll get the uh you'll have like you'll shadow this person for a few gigs and then you then i ended up basically just being the live sound engineer right. there and then at the same time i was the assistant director of another youth center and that guy encouraged me or the the director of that youth center encouraged me to pursue audio engineering as a career so i did live sound for a sound reinforcement company uh, while I was saving up money to go to Spain to SA Institute, uh, the School of Audio Engineering, or I think that's what it's called now, just the SA Institute. It's all over the world, has campuses all over the world. Uh, in the US, it's, you know, LA, Atlanta, all the hubs, you know. But I went to Spain, to Madrid, because it was cheaper. And um, I kind of wanted to to learn Spanish or sort of master my i had learned spanish in school because i took a lot of languages in high school and i wanted to pursue spanish sort of on the side sort of as an as an unofficial extracurricular activity so all the so i went to spain uh, at the height of the economic crash mm -hmm. and all of my savings was just kind of not i wouldn't say wiped out but definitely the the currency exchange at the time was really uh, bleeding me dry uh so that was uh it was rough but really taught you a lot about budgeting how to live on like five euros a day which is uh <laughs> came in handy uh but yeah i went to audio engineering school in spain there there and took and that was a year uh, of technically back in the day you could do a year which was basically a, a diploma or an un or sort of a vocational degree and then you could continue for another year and get a degree like a ba in 
audio engineering or of music production, whatever it's called. But during the first year, I met a girl and as one does. Yeah, as one does. She was backpacking through Europe. I was uh, studying and we uh, we liked each other as they do. And uh, and fast forward that sort of uh, that sort of side story. Now we live together in Tucson. We have been married for five years and or actually close to seven if you count the immigration wedding too. And now we have a four day old uh, daughter, which is great. Congrats. So adorable. Oh, man, that's so exciting. Yeah. So in audio engineering school in Spain, I started writing down everything that I uh, learned and blogging about it um, and never stopped blogging. And then when I graduated there, I came to Tucson because she went to law school here. And the easiest way to stay in the U.S. uh, legally is to become a student. So I went and became a student again. I went to Pima. I went to a community college here and then I transferred over to the University of Arizona. And I got a business economics and entrepreneurship degree. At the University of Arizona, uh, I started a startup called Crowd Audio, which was basically a, a mixing music mixing version of the ninety nine designs. Oh, model. yeah! Musicians would post their multi tracks, and then engineers would compete for the best mix. Oh, yeah! So we did Crowd Audio for a while while I was in college, and meanwhile, I was I was still writing audio uh, on audio issues writing right. books and things like that. And after after college, we we ran crowd audio for a while until we sort of just it's it sort of fizzled out in a way like technical reasons because none of us were like coders, but mm. also we sort of wanted to do other things and we started spreading out across the country, you know, university the university uh, experience really helps keep you together in the same city, but once yeah. once people graduate, they might take jobs elsewhere and stuff like that. So I, uh, that sort of, we disbanded that basically uh, after a few years, but we were profitable and it was, it was a really fun experience for sure. And then I just focused on audio issues and I've been focusing on audio issues ever since then, more or less. Uh, Writing books, step-by-step mixing came out in 2017, the first version. Uh, I wrote, I rewrote the book and published it last uh in 2019 i think it's due it's actually kind of due for a third version uh, because how i how i write a lot of the books is i'll blog about a subject for maybe a couple of years and then i will just put a lot of that together and sort of edit it together for com- for comprehension so that it's concise and and sort of a solid piece of work and then uh, then i release that as a book so yeah, I feel like that's a really good way to write some. I was actually, have you read, um, have you read, uh, Steal Like an Artist? Oh, by yeah. By Austin Cleon? Yeah, I have Keep Going right there. I need to get Keep Going. So I read, uh, I, I read both, um, Steal Like an Artist and Show Your Work, which were fantastic. Back to back, they're great books. I need to read Keep Going. But, um, I got the, I got what I think is a really good idea for a book that I'd like to do. Um, at the time when I read that book, I was doing a lot of I was trying to grow my Instagram page, but I didn't have really a I didn't really have a reason to want to grow it. And so I was doing a bunch of tips and tricks um, where I would just basically, you know, on all sorts of different audio stuff on mixing, mastering, production, you know, using specific tools. And so I would use images and basically create these posts on with Canva and then I'd post them on Instagram. And I thought, oh, I know what I can do. I can do this for three or four years, post like every other day. And then I can take everything that I've posted and take all these images and create it into like 1001 production tips or something. Absolutely. Where every single page you flip is an image and it's talking about a certain effect and what you can do with it. And so I was like, I don't think anyone's doing that. I think that might be a really good idea. But then I like and then I but then I stopped post doing those posts on Instagram because it was taking away, you know, going into like the 80 20 principle. It was kind of taking away from the stuff that I need to be doing at the time that was actually getting me good results. Um, so I stopped doing that. But I was I keep thinking like 
I think I've got a little bit more free time, so I might want to start doing that to just build that library of stuff for myself later in the future to just combine into a book. Yeah, totally. I mean, like blogging your book is like a very standard or not. I, I don't know if it's standard, but it's a really good method because uh, writing a 50,000 word book or my, step by step makes things like 35,000 words is an undertaking. But if yeah. you commit to like 300, 500 words a day, that's not that bad. And they don't have to be great. You know, they just have to be on the page. Yeah. You can always edit it later. My girlfriend, Marty, she's my editor. She's editing an article for me today. I like, I'll, I'll write through an article and I'll be, and she, she just marks it up like crazy. Cause I, <laughs> I'm terrible with g grammar and I'll just get in my head. I just need to get it out on the paper and then leave it to someone else to edit that stuff. But You've got a new book out, which is why I wanted to have you here, which is called You Get What You Give. Um, I crushed through it. It is fantastic. I've got it here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that book? Because it's, in, it, it's an inspiration from a book that I religiously tell my listeners to read, which is The Go-Giver. So go ahead, take the floor and tell us all about it. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. I really appreciate you taking the time to read it. Uh, also leaving a review. I saw that review. It's uh, super helpful for me for sure. But yeah, you're right. So uh, The Go-Giver didn't, The Go-Giver is great. I have it on the shelf there and it's a great book, but it's maybe not rock and roll enough for the music producers. And although the principles and sort of the business principles and the success strategies, as I like to call them, are, um, are great in any industry. So what I wanted to do was write a quote unquote, a go giver style business parable for music producers that want to achieve success in the music industry, whether they're the, whether they're, you know, music producers, beat makers, studio engineers, uh, like online mixing engineers, or, you know, what, whatever, really, uh, because it, it is applicable sort of across the board because there are more strategies, uh, broad term strategies than really nitpicky tactics. Right. So it's written as an, in a sort of a novel-esque way. So it's a narrative storyline. Uh, it's written in the third person and you're following the story of the protagonist, Casey, who is unhappy with his job. Uh, we really only see him in his job for like three pages or something yeah. because I make him very, I make him rage quit his job almost immediately at the beginning because he's so tired of working for the marketing agency that's uh, doing anything for anybody and therefore doing everything pretty poorly. Um, yep. And a lot of that stuff is based on just my knowledge of marketing, my knowledge of being a marketing strategist for hire, and just sort of understanding how, how the, that sort of agency model works. So he quits his job and because, and, you know, he went to technically went to audio school, but doesn't realize that, you know, even with audio chops, you still don't know what you how you can get clients or how you can achieve success and how you can really like make this a living. So he's, he quits his job and is basically at square one, but he has a bunch of equipment, you know? So he, 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 <laughs> the, the, the job allowed him the, uh, the privilege of buying gear, but who's gonna use the gear when you don't know yeah. how to get clients. Right. So he, you know, he try he throws everything at the wall to see what sticks and he quickly realizes that when you are trying to be do anything for anybody and you'll take any uh any deal available to you, you attract very low value and low quality clients. So true. Oh my god, it's crazy how true that is. <laughs> And so we see this scene where he, he's basically recording this band that um, does not appreciate him for what he's doing. And they also just, they, it's basically a sort of an amalgamation of the nightmare band, you know, in the studio that the, the drummer doesn't know how to play to a click. The drummer doesn't realize that he actually needs to be able to play. Uh, the, the singer is an egomaniac with a drug problem. <laughs> but throughout those 
those stories, I also do talk a lot about sort of music production and engineering in general, of like how to approach the session, how to uh, sort of how to have the mindset of like how, how to get good music going in the mm-hmm. studio. Even if you have an awful band, and so he, he he fails at first, of course, and then he gets bummed out. But he quickly gets introduced to a mentor who is sort of a uh, musicpreneur, I, I guess I call him character, mm-hmm. sort of an entrepreneur, basically a very successful person in the music industry. Uh, we see him uh, having a very sort. I would maybe rigid routine, almost sort of a, an otherworldly success routine. Like he's kind of very Zen, but also very approachable and personable at the same time. You know, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but when I was, when I was reading about the character's name is Noah, when I kept reading about him, especially on his habits page, which I, I love that chapter on the habits. Um, he reminded me kind of of, I, I don't know Billy Decker at all, but just from his interviews, he I got like I got a Billy Decker vibe from Noah when I was reading about him. Huh? Really? That's that's interesting. I yeah. don't know enough about I like I, I'm yet I need to read his book. I've, it's come across my radar too many times not to check it out. His new uh-huh. uh, mixing template book, and I do use uh, some of his plugins, the Joey Sturgis plugin. Yeah, dude, those Joey. I haven't used any of those, but I've heard of them. I've seen clips of them, and they look oh, they're fantastic. They're, they're great. They're great. Yeah, so, but he's basically based on, you know, the sort of overall, ca- like, archetype of the mentor person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of uh, Bob Iger, who's the CEO of Disney in him. There's a little bit of Charles Schwab in him. Okay. There's a little bit of Tim Ferriss in him. Uh, oh, yes. Tim my Ferris. routine is sort of like, or his routine is very much modeled after my routine in certain ways let's dive why don't we kind of pick apart this chapter in the or yeah this chapter right now because the so the chapter and the success strategy is all about building healthy habits and this is actually something that i'm currently going through right now and i think just about everyone regardless of even what industry you're in healthy habits are very important and having like almost a ritual-esque type thing where you kind of do you know, these repetitive tasks that further you in a positive way are very, very significant. You know, it's like one grain of sand at a time. It just builds up this massive thing. What was your inspiration for that, for that chapter? Because I really, it, it's a perfect, like the way you just break down his routine in the morning and this, how this sets him up for his entire day. I'm curious, like, when did you realize that the, you know, habits did, had this effect? And what I guess what is your your current routine? I'll go over mine too once yeah, you're done. Definitely. Uh, so I've had a a morning routine, if you if you will, for a very very long time, um, and it's all based on because I've I've been indoctr- indoctrinated by you know the Tim Ferriss cult, if you will, yeah. <laughs> of like doing like I meditate. So my basically my my ideal routine that I try to stick to is i get up and i do well i have to walk the dog so i get a little bit of walking yep uh i i meditate i read a page of um i do i read the daily stoic a page of the daily stoic by ryan holiday which is great so good yeah. ego is the enemy one of the best books oh ever. yeah no i've yeah he's ryan holiday is definitely one of my favorite authors and then i actually do read a page of and this is not a, a suggestion for anybody else really but I do read uh, a page of Halvamal every day, which is mm. the words of Odin, and they're in sort of Old Norse. So I read, I read, <laughs> dude, that's badass. That talk about metal. <laughs> so I have a book that's basically the words of Odin. In high school in Iceland, you have to read Halvamal in Old Norse, mm. and so I've always liked. And a lot of Odin's wisdom is basically: don't be an asshole, be a good guest, know how to throw a party, <laughs> drink in moderation. Uh, like, don't leave your sword at home, <laughs> <laughs> dude. I love those. I'm a, I'm gonna have to pick up Norse and, and start reading this. Yeah. So he has it. It has like um the book I have now is is uh, the I, the English translations, then the analysis, and then it it has Old Norse in the back. So now I'm basically I flip through the Old Norse because the Old Norse is very 
uh, close to Icelandic, so I, I understand some of the Old Norse words. And then I sort of refer to the English just to see how it, how it all ties together. Yeah, so, but all this to say, I do a little bit of reading, so two pages of reading, and then I do 10 minutes of meditation. I do try to do um, some yoga or some stretching, and then I do running, and if I can, some sort of exercise like that, from cardio, and then I try to write a little bit at the beginning of the day. How, mu how much does your routine take up of your morning? I would say it's probably about an hour and a half. Yeah. You know, and this is actually something that I've been. So uh, I'll wake up at 830 to work. I, I have to work starting exactly at 830. And so I'll sleep until the very last minute. Um, and I've been doing this for a while. And it wasn't until just so I, I started doing this new goal setting for the entire year that I did with my girlfriend, where we sit down for five minutes it takes about two hours or so, which I want to do this with my clients. Um, but basically, you have these six different sections that are like it's like health, finance, art of life, um, charity, craft and career. And there's another one that I'm spacing on. But you spend five minutes writing down a paragraph in the past tense of what you achieved that year. And then once you go through all of those, then you spend another about five minutes or so writing your action items to start those because goals are nothing unless you are you have action items to actually do them. Um, and so I like I've set up this new routine like for the past three months. I've been meditating as well. I've been getting really into the meditation stuff, which I love. Um, and I, I just I took like a month break because of all this vacation stuff I was doing. I was too lazy to do it. <laughs> but I started back up again. Have you heard of uh, Waking Up by Sam Harris? Oh, yeah. Sam Harris, the 10% happier guy. Yeah. Yeah. 10% mm -hmm. happier it, changed my life. It's great, dude. Sam Harris is a legend. Uh, his w Waking Up is fantastic. It's his, he, it's his meditation app where he basically takes you through guided meditations. And he's got this whole lesson system, too. It's like 25 days, I think. He takes you through how to meditate. And then after that, you have daily meditations you can do where it's still guided with him. Changed my life. I mean, meditation is, it's fantastic. So um, I finally like realized, okay, well, I need to wake up earlier because every time I like I'll wake up and I have to start at 830 and it, I'll spend 30 minutes kind of going through my routine. And so finally, I'm like, all right, I got to go to bed earlier. I got to wake up earlier. And I've been doing that for a week now. And my routine is. Like I, I'll get up, I make my cup of coffee. I follow Chris Graham and Brian Hood, their their coffee addictions with how they brew everything. I'm right there with them. Um, and so I'll brew my coffee. I'll feed the animals. I'll I'll take the dog out sometimes if it's my day. My girlfriend, and I kind of switch off and then I'll meditate for 10 minutes and then answer some emails. And I'm like, I do all that and I'm like, shit, I still need another 30 minutes to like do some extra stuff. So I think I have to wake up even earlier. But the point is, is, you know, it might take an hour or an hour and a half out of your morning. But doing that stuff to kind of it's almost like me time preparing yourself for the day, making sure that you're taken care of before you start the big legwork and, you know, really dive into what you need to get done. And man, does it feel good to like Get a head start on the day almost, you know, wake up a little bit earlier, get in your routines that you need to do. You get especially with meditation stuff. I mean, that talk about like one grain of sand at a time. I mean, it takes forever to really find out like how you need to meditate, um, what it's doing for you. And sometimes you don't even see good results until two months later when you're like, oh, you know what? Like, I'm much more calm. I'm not reacting to things as much. Um, it's it's amazing what that mindfulness can really do and the gratefulness. Yeah, it's because you it sort of it manages it allows you to sort of see the in the spaces in between the thoughts in a way. And yep. w one of the weird benefits of the meditation and sort of being able to think quicker in a way is I'm I'm getting really good at catching things that fall down shelves. Oh, interesting. It's like imagine if you're uh you're, like you're rummaging around on the top shelf and then because you're rummaging it like pushes something else and like maybe you know like a bottle falls down or whatever and but like i can see that out of the corner of my eye and i know where it's going and like i'm so clear in my head that i can just grab it 
on the way down. Just sort of uh-huh. like not not like going where like like Wayne Gretzky says, like going where the puck's going to be, yep. as opposed to like trying to catch the bottle where it was. I'm like I'm quick enough on my feet now, and I I attribute this to meditation. <laughs> It's the awareness, man. It's just being aware that because that's essentially what you're doing in meditation. You're just aware of the different sounds around you, of the thoughts going through your head, of feeling. Um, it's just the awareness, the mindfulness of like knowing kind of yourself and your surroundings. And so, yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense that you can kind of, you know, you get a sense of things that are going on around you without even necessarily without paying attention because that's the point. You know, you're not paying attention to any one thing really when you're meditating it's all things around you um that's funny though um yeah but the habit stuff i mean it's going through his daily routine routine i loved it it was really it was awesome to see kind of a breakdown of someone who's successful for routine and i mean you look at anyone successful and i guarantee they have a routine that they go whether it's exercise and then they go and do writing or they do reading um, and then th- they just go through this list of things that they need to get done so that they can take care of themselves and then they can kick ass throughout the entire day. And I think it just, it's not necessarily the routine, like, well, well there is the routine, but there's no one routine that's better. Yes. It's mm-hmm. having the routine because it's ultimately about control. So yeah. if you're in control, that's what really matters but if you're not in control of what you're supposed to be doing that day from the very start of your day you need to think you need to really be uh really look at what like what changes you need to make in your life because if you're constantly reacting to other people's agendas instead of making your own and sticking to your own stuff uh like you're you're not gonna you're not gonna have the clarity and the awareness to actually uh, have have the success that you want Right. Well, the healthy habits, you know, if if you're not building healthy habits, it's hard to really get anywhere. It's, you know, if you want to be a great musician, it's not like you can just play whatever instrument you're playing or write any tracks once a month and then that's it. And like, just wait. I mean, if you want to be a musician and a great one, you got to practice. You have to have like habits down where I'm practicing this hour and then I'm going to write it this hour. And you got to do that consistently. It's, you know, the the quantity will build up over time and it just you realize oh shit six months later i've progressed significantly because of these good healthy habits yeah and people don't want to believe that i remember this meme where it's i think it's there's somebody that's gushing over a musician and and the gusher is basically like oh my god you're so good at your instrument like it must like you must have been born with it and then the musician's like it it was practice i mean it must have it just it must be like in your finger it was practice I mean, it. I, yeah. w- I would have loved to be able to. I'll never be able to do that because I wasn't born with this innate. But it was practice, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's so so rare that you find that. I mean, it's like well, probably less than one percent that you find those people where it is almost natural. They're just a freak of nature where you're like, oh Jesus, this took you two years to do this, and they just get it. I and mean, those freak of natures are out there. Um, you may be one, but probably not. And I mean, even when I was. When I was doing a lot of EDM production um, and trying to be a big producer and DJ and whatnot, uh, I thought the same thing all the time. And it is almost like this victim mentality that people, some people have where, or even you could even say it might be imposter syndrome where they go, oh, well, that person's just where they're at because they've got something that I don't have. You know, they've, and they probably do. And what it is, is the practice, you know, right. or the time, the time yeah, they, the t- they put in the time. Like if you're comparing yourself to somebody that that took five years to get to where they are and you expect to just like go through a wormhole at five years into the future and have those things you're fooling yourself you know you have to put in the time you have to put in the the effort of learning and getting to you, nobody hands you status you earn it. yes and respect same with respect in your industry you gotta you know you gotta work for those kinds of things uh what's your favorite chapter out of the book i'm actually curious what it is uh let's see Wow, oh, that's a hard question to to answer. I think, uh, well, to be fair, I like the imposter syndrome chapter a lot because yeah. it sort of it sort of goes, but like in there's a there's a flashback ha- like halfway through it where he's just in Iceland, and uh, so like that one was good. I really liked the first 
lunch because it just is um it sort of sets the scene for everything sets the tone for sure and then um i like like the epilogue is is sort of more is is the most novel-esque of them all i think it's uh very much coming from me at Mm -hmm. in that way like i have that or uh, my dad actually does have that uh bo skaggs record like that is no that kidding. is a personal memory of mine. Yeah, damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like yeah. that song is very like close to me and is like that story is just autobiographical. Yeah, yeah. I love that the epilogue was a nice way of tying things up of kind of, like almost a touch of looking into the future of what happened, and it was a nice tie up of the. It was like okay, sweet. The hero of the story got you know he got what he wanted. It was very well tied up. The imposter syndrome. One, I love to. That's what I wrote part of my review on. And I'm I'm so obsessed with imposter syndrome because it it's something that's just not talked about enough. Um, everyone goes through it. Uh, one of the biggest producers in my industry for electronic music, his name is Gareth Emery. Ton of, I mean, everyone listening probably knows who he is, but he just posted, he just made a post on, I think it was Facebook or Instagram. Where he's, I think he's releasing a new album, and this is the first time he's ever sang and been recorded singing. He's releasing a song. He's like, I'm fucking scared as shit. And it's like, dude, this is one of, I mean, the dude has written for the biggest artists. He's been in the top 100 DJs. He's, he's made it. I mean, he's extremely successful. And here's a guy who's like probably dealing with crazy amounts of imposter syndrome. And it's almost like when you're at that level two, the impo- imposter syndrome's even bigger because it's like the pressure is on you know you've got a major audience that are they have these expectations right and that's also it's interesting because a lot of times people don't succeed because they're actually afraid of their success they don't know if they can handle that like what if i do all these things and it doesn't work is one option but like what if i do all these things and my life changes and i might not like it or i'm not ready for that or things of that nature like that that's equally and and that's not necessarily something people actively aware are aware of in their thinking yeah uh but it's easier for them to be like oh well i'll never succeed you know because it's easier to be it's easier to not try than to try and succeed and then be terrified of your success It's also easier, you know, that victim mentality as well. You know, if you see someone else and say, well, again, like we were talking about earlier, they have something that I don't. It's easier to just say that and kind of dwell in it rather than being like, well, no, I have to actually fail in order to succeed. So it's going to be a lot of that before I see anything great coming out of this. Yeah, I really I really like that. Um, let's talk about impact, because that was a major, major theme of the book. and. It made me, you know, I really liked the way I can't. What chapter was it in? Um, I think it was when he met up with uh, who's the second person that he met up with at the group meeting. Uh, so there is. It's when they were talking about positioning yourself, like how to position yourself. Yeah. So like the when when uh the drummer or the Amy is with them or. Are they at the Japanese restaurant? The Yeah, I think it's the Japanese restaurant. Japanese restaurant. Okay, okay. Yeah, the Japanese restaurant is when they're talking about sort of what problem are you solving and how, yes, how like that's right. the band like a band playing a venue is solving a problem for the venue. They're not like they they're not no no musician is entitled to play live. They mm-hmm. the, the reason venues and bars and you know people hire you to perform is that they have a problem that they're hoping you can solve. Like in the case of a bar or a venue, they're they're hoping they draw you draw a crowd so that they can make money off the bar or ha- or part of the ticket sales, whatever. Unfortunately, musicians tend to not truly understand that the industry is all working as a business except them sometimes, and they just want to be artists, which they should be, but they really need to have a s- slight business mentality when it comes to just understanding the other person's point of view like think about it yes. from their side like why like why should we care about your music in a yeah. way like how does how does your music or your fan base or your audience or your platform how does that 
help the 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 band or the 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 other person the the your customer quote unquote because as a touring band like a, a venue is your customer uh, your fans are your fans your audience are your fans they're also con- your customers to a certain extent because they pay tickets and then buy merch and stuff like that but there's there's a primary customer in the form of the venue and then there's a secondary customer sort of in the form of the audience or the fan that's really interesting i've never thought about it that way as like the venue being a customer of the artist but that makes so much sense it's it is true and you know, going into, I'm so happy you mentioned it because I mentioned it over and over again. It's the reason for the podcast is for producers and artists to learn the business side of the industry. You know, it's the stuff that the artists don't want to learn that they need. You know, art, like you said, artists should be artists. They, they're they creating art, but there is a business side to this whole thing. Um, and that impact, you know, the whole impact theme of the entire book really struck me and the problem solving and positioning because it made me look at my business and go, the way you just put into words of how to position yourself and how to problem solve really made sense. It kind of struck this light where I was like, oh, okay, because, you know, like the Six Figure Home Studio podcast, Chris and Brian talk about that all the time, how important positioning is. Um, and they explain it well, but I don't think that you explain it in a different sense where when you put the words on paper, for some reason, it just clicked me. I was like, OK, like I understood it before, but now I really understand. Now I'm like, re, like analyzing my business, like, am I positioning properly? How can I position for impact, too? Because that is what you're selling, you know, whether or not you're doing mixing, mastering, recording, um, if you're doing vocal editing or if you are just a musician. I mean, the impact that you're trying to make as a musician is all about the music you're making um, and how are you making an impact with that music and how can you translate that you are making an impact with that music. And I think when you're looking at impact as artists or producers, it really comes across as, you know, let's say you are trying to get more fans and that's you're trying to make an impact with your fans. It's, I think it, at that point, it's all about the storytelling and how you can get them to relate to the message that you're trying to send out to people. And that is, I mean, that, do you do you have any experience with drawing that impact of like telling I mean actually no you definitely have some advice you could probably give for telling a story the right way cuz your email marketing for anyone that listened to the two part email marketing series that I did everything I learned from is Bjorgvin here I might need to bring you on for another episode another day to talk about email marketing oh, cuz you are Dude, you're a ledge. It is. Oh my lord, Bjorkman is the is a beast at email marketing. Your sto- the way you talk about how you need to tell a story. Really, I I had already written like twenty emails that I had in a um uh queue or whatever for when people join, and I had to go through and rewrite every single one of them because I was like, I'm not telling a story in any of these. Yeah. So, well, when it comes to impact, especially when it comes to fan base, like I I'd highly recommend people that aren't hip to Seth Godin to go check them out, him out because what he talks about a lot is this term he calls enrollment. Like, uh, the only way to lead people is that if they have enrolled on the, in the journey with you, right? They've, oh, okay. they've, they've like, uh, they've raised their hands and said, I'm in, I believe where you're going. Uh, I think that you can help me out. Right. So they're enrolled in the journey of like, whether that is, whether you're helping them out, with some you know practical stuff or whether you're just in- entertaining them with your music or your content or whatever you have to you have to sort of sh- relate to them in such a way that they are they they are happy to follow right and telling your story is probably the easiest way to find the people that can relate to you because if you don't tell your story how on earth is anybody going to know how they can relate to you if they have no idea who you are what you stand for where you come from what you like dislike you know what your pet peeves are uh like there's a reason you we have friends it's that they like the same stuff as we do they understand you they they kind of like they may think that like some of your views are stupid but they like you anyway (laughs) yeah you know, and because it's the way that you are and you're, you're personable and you're like authentic as a term has been like driven into the ground too, too hard. But it's just sharing, you know, being you in in such a way that is helpful to them. 
don't be you like completely like there there is a dark side or there is an edge to where you don't need to share your story because if it doesn't benefit them in any way if you're just ranting or you're bitching about stuff or you uh, are maybe too personal and and it has no real benefit to your your followers as as an audience that came to you for a specific reason i have failed at this multiple times which is why i learned why i preach it because i've learned that like right. the hard way but always keep in mind like it's it's always back and forth kind of like how we talked about the venue and the, and the, the, the venue and the band it's like why are why are people on your list why are they listening to you what did they come to you to for in the beginning and how can you share your story in such a way that creates a connection uh for them to you and also helps them out in the same time because i've been running audio issues for 10 years and a lot of people come to me and it's like when they act either e either actually meet me you know go on a zoom call or join me for one of the like group coaching calls that i do as uh, with my insiders they sometimes they say like i feel like i know you so well you know and i've like never like i've never talked to them before or like yep. I, may, I may have like read their emails and replied to them via email but because of the way i share my story and because of the way like like the first time you get on my email list i share a very specific story and like i tried to sort of tackle uh my arc while simultaneously showing them the techniques that they came there to learn you know? like i talk about my first few weeks as a live sound engineer uh at the at the old library as it was called um and and i talk about and i tell that story of me being basically thrown into the deep end but the the purpose of one of those blog posts is that's where I realized that 250 to 200 hertz is muddiness because I, I realized that on the knobs when I was like working, uh, working the live sound. So like I give them the tip that is helpful to them, but I also share who I am, what I stand for, where I come from at the same time uh, without being, you know, too uh, long winded. But I'm also, yeah. I'm also predominantly a writer. So like, telling stories is sort of has become more natural to me don't don't get me wrong like i did not like i said it's practice like yeah. <laughs> i did not i was not a great writer to begin with but when you write 500 words or so every day for 10 years you end up uh, knowing thing to about syntax and grammar yeah. and storytelling <laughs> That's fantastic. 500 words a day is crazy, especially when you look at like an entire year. That's just that's that's so, so many damn words, so much to tell. I love that. But the story, yeah, the storytelling thing is so important. That's, you know, I've been I preached to that's another thing that I preach very significantly. I OK, before I listened to you and I first heard about you on the Six Figure Home Studio podcast, um, I thought email marketing was bullshit. I was like, who's doing email. like i don't look at my emails uh who who the hell is you know why would i do email marketing then i listened to the day i listened to your episode in the six figure home studio i went home and i started a mailchimp account and i started writing emails i was like all right i'd like i'm fully converted this is fantastic and after i've ran my own email marketing list and actually when i when i re-listened to that episode and i started rewriting my emails i noticed immediately my open rate like doubled and same with my click through rate. I was like, holy shit, there is something to the, to this. And since then I've been preaching to musicians and artists. Like if you're not growing an email list, you're leaving so much out on the table, especially if, you know, if you start a new tour, or if you're going to be playing in a specific city, you can easily, you know, tag those people in that email to just send to those people in a specific city. Um, but then also being able to like, and the more we're talking about it here, but being able to like tell your story as musicians, why you're involved in music, why you want to be involved with music. That's what people want to, you know, they will, they want to relate to the art. They can relate to it. It's you're going to build super fans, especially with, you know, I actually just did my, the last episode that was released last week. Um, I did the entire episode on, um, have you heard of it? Have you heard the band, the main? Uh, yeah. Love the main. Dude, I love the main. They're from Tucson, aren't they? No, I th are they? 
they're from Arizona. I don't know if it's Tucson, but I know they are from Arizona. But the main is, dude, I've been listening to them since 2009. I've seen them so many times. And um, I actually had a, you know, James Cross, right? Uh, not sure. He's he's brian's assistant oh yeah 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 right, right, right. so um i was on in i we did a like a meeting or whatever because i think i'm gonna start sending podcasts to him to have edited and he listened to the podcast and we got into my music history and i mentioned the main and he's like dude i don't know why you haven't done an episode on the main like they're so big and they're content like they're still getting bigger and bigger every day and what like seems like a dying genre and i was like that's actually a really good point. And so I started looking through their feed and I was like, they're very consistent with their posts. They're still, I mean, writing almost an album every single year. They're growing their fan base like crazy. So I was like, damn, this is actually, this is really interesting. So I did a whole analysis on the main. And one thing that I noticed is that they almost very specifically write albums. I was like, okay, well, and they're promoting them for almost an entire year. So that right there, they have the content and they have the stories in the album. And then they can continue to tell their story through the content that they're posting with the album. And so I was like, that is like genius. I mean, no wonder why their fan base continues to grow on. And they've created super fans, people who are like they have. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I am still listening to them today is because I had I mean, I was going through a lot when I was a teenager, when I was younger, um, and all I was doing was listening to the main and they have a bunch of like breakup songs and stuff. And so I'll go back and listen to those and remember like that time and how much more simple it really was. I didn't realize it at the time, um, but like I, I almost remember these personal stories of mine through the stories that they tell of their own music. And again, it's create a super fan. I've I've shared their music with a bunch of people i've listened to so many of their albums i've bought albums i bought merch so they've you know if you look at the then you can almost start to look at the lifetime value of a customer through that as a fan which is great data to know if you're trying to be a full-time musician but that one thing the albums compared to like releasing singles this is something i mentioned like singles are great they're not bad but there's not, a, you know, there's not a deeper story that you can usually tell where as as you can with like an album, an album, there's 10, 15 songs that you're writing an entire story through that each band member can write a story about. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance there and there's a lot to be said. Definitely. Yeah. So like the whole single versus album promotions thing is is interesting because uh i i truly like albums uh and and i looked up the main here and like the so i had uh, a 21 year old assistant a couple of years ago and she turned me on to the main and i i think that band was like my top favorite band on spotify wrapped that year or whatever just like very much like the sort of music i listened to when i was uh like mm-hmm. in my 20s and still do, but not as much as I did then, right? When I was in a band that sounded like similar to that. But when it comes to like the albums versus singles, uh, especially when you're doing everything as an indie artist, like it's easy to do. A, a, and a lot of my audience are are like working on their own music, and they're doing everything themselves. And at that point, I always recommend like do a single because it's like less work to yeah. do one single. And you can just release a single and then you talk about that and you always have and then you maybe release another song four to eight weeks later and then always have something new to talk about until you get into this groove of like that being normal for you. This cycle of of, of like writing, recording, mixing, releasing, writing, recording, mixing, releasing, promoting, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and then you might want to do a, a bigger body of work. Right. And but the and the album and you can also do the album. Um, like later or first and then you just it, it's really about the promotional part because you re- yes if you release an album and you're constantly promoting the album every time like every month for like a year that can get tiring but mm-hmm. you have to think about my one of the one of the mentors that i uh learned from ramit sati sati he talks about the prism strategy which is basically you know like the you know the dark side of the moon cover you get a light and then through a prism it has all these different colors so right so a one album although it's one thing how many stories are in that album right 
Like mm -hmm. the stories of the recording, the stories of each individual song, the stories of the artwork, the stories of, of like any, well, basically anything that happened during the creation process. Right. Yeah. And you write that down, you talk about it and you, 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 you just come up with a list and then those are though that's your promotional content because it's not marketing mm -hmm. in the annoying brand marketing like spamming your email with hey check out this new album it re was released last week and this is the, your third post saying that same thing <laughs> or like brands that are just plain boring and they have nothing mm -hmm. to say um that's why email i think that's why email marketing and marketing in general just gets a lot of flack because yeah. it's done very poorly most mm -hmm. of the time because big companies just pile money into advertising and they don't think about at the end of the day, uh, there's an individual on the other side with a credit card and have you connected with that individual. And as an independent artist, your audience is going to be smaller than Coca-Cola or GE's, yeah. right? And which is good because it enables you to be flexible and have those sort of almost individual conversations. Yeah. And people like being a part of the, you know, uh, almost, I've talked about this religiously too. Have you read Contagious? I think it's by, I think it's Jonah Berger. It's great. Such a good book. Um, but it takes, talks, he talks about how to make viral content, like why content goes viral. Um, and there's this social currency aspect of if you're a part of this like secret group. You know, if you're a part, if you know a musician before they blow up, right? All you talk about after they blow up is, oh, I knew them before they blew up. You know, the hipster stuff that people yeah. always say. Um, so people like being a part of, you know, something that's unique and different and not everyone knows about because they can go and tell their friends about it and they introduce them to it and be like, see, I know good stuff. I'm, you know, it's, it's the kind of egotistical stuff of people. But yeah, you know, uh, uh, one, uh, I, that's that's funny you bring it up like you knew somebody before they blew up or whatever uh do you know of monsters and men yes mm -hmm. so they um I, lo I i love telling this story just because it's funny because especially because iceland's just tiny it's just a right yeah super small spot so that music venue i used to work at as a live sound engineer there was this uh there was a band called cliff clavin and if I didn't really know this at the time because I wasn't a Cheers fan, but Cliff Clavin is like the guy at the end of the bar at, uh, at, uh, in Cheers. But mm -hmm. they played stoner rock, so like Queens of the Stone Age style rock. Uh, really cool band. But then the drummer went on to become the drummer in Of Monsters and Men. No shit. And Art not, it's like it's like a great guy. I did live sound for him multiple times. We hung no out a shit. lot. No shit. And because it's just a tiny community, but whenever I see him on, you know, on a video or whatever, I'm just like laughing because it's just, it's, it's like seeing, you're seeing somebody become something much bigger than what you knew them as. And you're so happy for them at the same time. Yeah. That's like this, there's this guy, um, his name's Kaiwachi. He's huge now in our scene. I mean, playing all the major festivals, but he grew up where I grew up. He's two years older than me. I've hung out with him a couple of times and I remember at we for the for, we met each other for for the first time walking by each other at a music festival because we had chatted online and stuff and he was like on this very clear path where everyone kind of knew we're like oh this guy is going to be huge I mean just he connected with the right people with the right record label who was blowing people up and it was such a tight knit group and you're like oh yeah I mean he's set in stone and you know Three years later, four years later, he's playing the biggest festivals, has his own tour that he's headlining, um, has hundreds of thousands of fans now and just makes a living making music all the time. So, yeah, it's the same thing where it's like, oh, yeah, it's I'm talking to this guy who I know is going to be huge. We're hanging out for a couple of hours, one on one, getting to know him a little bit more. And then we never really talked much after that. But then just seeing like it's just seeing someone's name in lights that, you know, you're like, Jesus, that's fucking crazy. That's insane. Yeah. Um, um, if you I don't know if you've seen um, there's a the for the song Wild Roses off the Fever Dream album. There's a video of Monsters of Men and it all happens in this indoor swimming pool. And that's one of the th weird things about just how small Iceland is uh, like that's the swimming pool. I took swimming lessons in school for almost no seven years. Shit. 
<laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> well, talk about you talk about telling a story. I'm sure like people from Iceland are probably like, yeah, we fucking know these people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We grew up with them. Yeah. They're, no, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Like it's because, well, there's no six degrees of Kevin Bacon in Iceland. It's more like one bacon or two bacon. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Um, I'm curious, uh, what are so what do you do specifically to kind of draw some impact for your or like wh- how are you making an impact with your clients and wh- what what would you suggest to people who are trying to figure out how to make an impact? Obviously, get the book because the book does a great explanation of that. Um, but in your own words, kind of, I mean, I guess the book is in your own words. But what would you say in this interview setting? Well, so um, how would yeah? Well, let's let me say this. So basically, audio issues sort of encompasses a lot of the stuff that I talk about in the book. Like I am audio issues is not for everyone. It's for a very specific type of person: home studio musicians, bedroom producers. They want to learn the technical skills of mixing and uh, all, all of those sort of production skills and gain the confidence to be uh, proud to release their, their records. So what I usually might sort of quote unquote tagline often is, is uh, I help you confidently finish your mixes so you can be proud to release your record. And so I'm working at sort of the top, if you know the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I'm working at the top. I am trying to foster a sense of confidence so that you can self-actualize as an artist. So that you can take that final step and release your music because that music deserves to be out there and be heard by other people because I've heard it and it's amazing. You know, like people send me their songs that they're working on all the time and I I can sometimes go like, well, I mean, it, the low end is a little muddy or whatever and it, or it, the vocals are a little harsh or it can be louder like those are all just technical issues that are super easy to solve but what i want to help you solve for yourself as my audience when i say you is i want you to be confident in like yeah this song is good enough it deserves to be released i should put this out as a beginning of my body of work and i do a lot of that much the biggest impact I probably have is with my insiders members because it's all about that. It's all about helping them get feedback on their productions so that they can improve their mixes to the point where they just release their music because there's a group of their peers. We have Feedback Friday every other week where people bring their mixes or their works in progress and we just workshop them until nobody has any further feedback. And at that point, it's like, it's time to be released. And you wouldn't believe how many people are scared that their that their music isn't good enough. When you when you play it and you're like, "Damn, I wish I could make this." You know? And and that's a, a lot of a lot of the things that I do now re, like most recently is just through sort of this group coaching and making sure that they are confident in releasing what they have to offer musically to the world because i think that if you look back on your life and you didn't release those records aren't you going to regret that you know and i think you should like it and it's the same with the books because i'm more predominantly a writer and sort of a, a, a producer coach than a musician songwriter in any way I, i've been in bands and, and released records and stuff like that but I have the same I had the same sort of imposter syndrome and worry that you get what you give wasn't good enough because I was like who is is anybody going to like this like do, does this matter like who am I just fooling myself that this somebody would care enough to read read this but obviously I was wrong because it sold a lot of copies in the first week everybody uh was very uh, like everybody loved it I got a lot of really great reviews I'm very happy to have um, to have, you know, taken that step. And like I say in the introduction, it's kind of ironic that I have this aversion to releasing this body of work when my entire business model is, or my entire sort of impact model in a way, is making other artists feel confident enough to release their own work. And it goes to like, 
um, my dad used to say this all the time, and and then I realized that it's 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 sort of you know it's attributed as a quote to Mark Twain of like you know you you paraphr I'm paraphrasing, but basically you will regret the things that you didn't do more than the things you did. Right. Within reason. Yeah, course. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to creative creative work and sort of um you know feeling like it, like feel scared to put yourself out there. Like that that actually is an indicator of uh of you might be going in the right direction. Like you said, like the well, ego is the enemy, obstacle is the way. That is where you should be going. I just read Mary Forleo's book, Everything is Figure Outable. And she has, um, I can't remember. She she created a bunch of acronyms for fear that like meant something else. I'll, I'll have to look it up. I'll send it to you or whatever. I'm put, yeah, I'm putting that in my book list. Yeah, definitely read that. I, I finished that one just like very fast. It was very easily readable and, and a lot of fun, very inspirational. So definitely check that out. But like fear is basically telling you that you may be going in the right direction because if you are scared, you are pushing you're the envelope of your, of your comfort yeah. zone. Yeah, the comfort zone thing, getting out of your comfort zone is so important. You know, I actually just started doing jujitsu in November. Nice. And there was so many. I mean, I've been wanting to start jujitsu for years and I haven't done it because it's like I I don't want to be put in that weird position where I don't know where I'm doing and I'm embarrassed because I don't know what I'm doing and I, I want people to make fun of me. And that is so far from what happens when you go to jujitsu. Like, at least it depends on what gym you go to, but the gym I go to, everyone was so people were walking up, introducing themselves to me, showing me some stuff, helping me. And now like I'm obsessed and I love it. And still, there's still this kind of, I'm still getting over this mental feat of wanting to go because I am still so new and I still don't know stuff. Um, and it is, I haven't met every, everyone. So it's almost nervous when you have to pick a partner and work with that. Oh, are they going to, you know, are they going to make fun of me because I'm not doing things right when, it's just bullshit in my head. That's not true. You know, it's all about what imposter syndrome is, but it's helped me grow as a person. And that's what's important there is. And you're totally right. You know, getting that fear and that nervousness, those butterflies in your stomach are a great indicator of, you know, depending on what you're doing, is probably the right choice to make into something you need to just push through so you can mentally get there. You know, you can become a little bit more comfortable with it and and get an experience that you probably wouldn't get otherwise. And you could tell great stories through those too. I mean, going right into what we're talking about marketing, you know, that's... Yeah, I mean, sharing your failures, sharing your wins, sharing your lessons, these are all... If you, if you decide to change your perspective and think about marketing as storytelling, it yeah. just becomes what story do you want to tell and how do you think that story can help enlighten inspire inform slash educate or entertain other people like that's all you need to do just put yeah. that put that out there and in, in, in whatever shape you like putting it out there you seem like you, your thing is a podcast my thing is more or less a blog i do youtube videos too but uh it's but just if you're good at writing write. if you're good at making videos make videos if you're good at talking make a podcast like yes. don't don't let any of that stuff stop you uh if you if you're wondering about like if you're deciding between a bunch of different things and you don't know which one to start with uh the worst choice is nothing you know so cho choose one it doesn't matter just pick one if you don't like doing that after a few weeks then pick the other one if that like riles you up and gets you going stick with it but yeah. the inaction is you know cliche as it's cliche, the worst thing yeah it as cliche that, as it that, is, it's, you know, a, a, an object that at rest stays at rest. Not doing anything at all is ultimate failure. That is true failure. Um, you know, doing something and and I do a whole episode on this. Uh, I think it's called Stop Failing and Start Succeeding. And I talk about how, you know, failure is more so this learning aspect. It's not really failing. You know, when you talk about failing, failing is ultimately not doing it, you know, not doing the thing that you could try out you know if you don't try it out you don't know if you're gonna like it you're really failing it at that point you know if you do something and you fuck up or you mess up and you 
quote unquote fail, like what people say, you and you learn something from that and grow from it, then you're not really failing at that point. You really are succeeding. You took a great lesson from that. You changed your mindset or changed the way you're doing something. And now you're getting into that, you know, like we said, good habits and this successful mindset of moving forward and taking what you learned and applying that to life. Yeah, it's about like, yeah, you, no, you're you're so right. It's just the learning learning process. Like, and I think of especially entrepreneurship, and especially when it comes to so advertising is obviously a subset of marketing. I look at at because I run a lot of ads, and that becomes almost more scientific uh, when it comes to failure because when your ads don't perform you you know it from the numbers it becomes a scientific yeah. experiment but you can think of anything as an experiment like what happens like what's the engagement or what's the reaction i get if i talk about this do i get replies to my emails do i get people to click through just look at the, look at the behavior of the people that you're talking to to gauge whether things are succeeding or not are people listening using to the spe specific words too? even, you know, if you change the way you phrase a word that in and of itself can change the way someone, you know, whether they open. I actually started. So I used to going right into what you're talking about with my emails in my subject line. I used to just put exactly what I'm writing about, like very in very plain word, like letters, just the title, like how to use a compressor. Um, and then I stopped doing that. And I don't remember if it was based off of a recommendation you made somewhere. I I would imagine it probably was. I can't remember, but I started to change the way I created subject lines and like making it more practical and talking about like asking a question or putting it more in a phrase or a statement of like, have you ever done this? Well, do you want to do this or something? You know, making it not so much about like this very technical title, but instead making it about, uh, how like if someone are you having this issue that significantly increased my open rate and i was like jesus that one little change it's very something very simple that i realized and that was all through you know again testing things out i have this title here that wasn't that great and then i changed the title and all of a sudden boom the open rate went up so and as a diy artist uh regardless of the type of art you are doing you're trying to create a platform and promote yourself you are a marketer uh, mm -hmm. some of the time, whether you like it or not. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you don't want to be, the only other way to, to, to not be is to hire it out. But if you're a DIYer that doesn't have the money to do so, you're stuck being a marketer. That's kind of have yeah. to live with that. But one of the biggest skills you can learn as a marketer to help your storytelling, to help your email open rates, to help your message spread further is just learn copywriting skills. So writing good copy, uh, because writing good copy is not just about writing ads that sell people on snake oil, right? And that's that's the thing that people uh, hate about copywriting. It's like, oh, it's just this, you know, it's just this bullshit product or whatever. But whereas actually that product might actually have helped a ton of people in general. But you as a marketer, musician, or what music producer, if you want to learn a skill that will help you improve your storytelling abilities, read, read copywriting, books, read books on how to write copy better because you can keep the story the same. You can keep the body of your message, the absolute same as, and if, but if you change like the subject lines, the headlines, and maybe the calls to action and just slightly tweak a few things you're going to see the engagement with your audience skyrocket. 100%. I totally agree. Dude, well, I think that might be it. Is there anything else you want to discuss? I think we kind of, we hit on all the points there. Yeah, I think I mean that was a lot. I don't know if I, know. I don't know if I mean I could obviously keep talking forever about any of these things, but uh just I'll tell I'll tell the audience that if they want to know anything more, uh just keep yeah, keep asking so. questions. Uh check check out the book at you get what you give book.com and uh, i'd be happy to come on talk about anything that we missed in the future if you wanted to have something about email marketing or copywriting that would be happy to do that and yeah so feel free to drop me a line at uh at audio issues just go to audioissues.com you can subscribe to the email list there if you want uh the the other book step-by-step -step mixing is helpful if you are 
uh, want to learn mixing techniques in general. And yeah, but otherwise, otherwise, I hope people listening found it useful. And I hope they check out the book if they have time to read. Um, and oh, they they better. I hammer into my audience. I'm like, you guys got to read, read, read. I'm actually putting together. I'm finally putting together my book list for the show that I'm going to post on the on my website. But um, if all the links will be on my on my website, nbsaudio.com slash episode 47. This is going to be the 47th episode actually coming out on my birthday on February 19th um super exciting but uh yeah i'll have all the links uh for both your books your website on all the on that page of my website you guys can go check out um as well as yeah links to the books obviously definitely get you get what you give i mean it is i'm probably going to trade in i was telling you this i'm probably going to trade in the go giver for this book from now on because it's very it's niche it's i mean very very much so the you know similar principles from the go-giver success strategies and I, they're every every chapter i was like i know what he's going to talk about and yep it's totally true so it was just it was really fantastic but well, i'm um, glad you like bjorkvin yeah thank you so much man i appreciate you coming on this was awesome and you're de- i'm definitely going to hit you up we're going to bring you on for some email marketing copyright stuff because i think that would be fun a lot uh, of fun yeah no happy to do so and thanks for having me of course take care man all right Hey guys, thank you for checking out this episode with Bjorkman. This one was a ton of fun. I've been waiting to get him on. So super happy that we got to sit down and talk a little bit about his book. You get what you give. I will have all of the links to his books, um, especially you get what you give, which I strongly recommend that all of you guys go read um, on enviousaudio.com slash episode 47. Go check that out. Grab a copy of his book. If you would like to check out the book list that I have created for all the books that I'm currently reading, the ones I've recommended on the show, and ones that I am uh, going to be recommending on the show in the future, head to enviousaudio.com slash booklist. You can check that out. Grab some books off of Amazon. That is an affiliate link too. So if you want to support the show, that's one of the best ways you can do it. Otherwise, go ahead and share this with a friend. Uh, Let them know if you think this episode would help them out. Other than that, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.